Once long ago, a father had remarried to a woman with two daughters, all of very strong will. His own only daughter, however, was very passive and loved her father too much to deny anything their new family requested. There was no task she wouldn't attend to for her stepmother, and no request she wouldn't take from her stepsisters, and they were all of them happy to benefit from her. The daughter spent her days tending to as many whims as possible, and rested at any other time by the fireplace where she would not be in the way. Amused by this habit, the older stepsister dubbed her their cinder wench because of the amount of soot collected on her hands and legs. The younger stepsister used a slightly different name, Cinderella with a hook for a hand, because she was slightly kinder than her older sister, and because Cinderella with a hook for a hand had a hook for a hand. And so Cinderella with a hook for a hand spent her days in service to her family, content with the virtue of her work and the knowledge that she was the only one among them who could properly scrape clean the dishes and pick away the lime buildup between the bathroom tiles. No amount of disrespect or mistreatment from her family could take that complacency away from her, but there was one desire in the back of her mind that might. How it clawed away at her contentness very much like her own hook would claw away at the wallpaper of the hallway to spell out the words the ball over and over. Yes, Cinderella with a hook for a hand wanted more than anything to go to the prince's ball, to bask in the company of royalty and to find solidarity in their royal deformities and inevitable birth defects from upper class inbreeding. She talked about it often with her sisters, and she talked about it often with the hens and pigs she fed in the field and she would sneak up to the attic and scoop up the cornered rats in the cages set around the grain and told them all about the ball as they clawed and bit at her flesh in desperate survival, which is likely how she lost her other hand in the first place, and was the deciding factor in sending her to a correctional home for the unsound. Now Cinderella with a hook for a hand was dressed in the finest straitjacket and slept in the comfiest of padded floors, and had her own servants to feed and clean and restrain her. It was a life of luxury she could never have dreamed of, but as long as she stayed there, she would never make it to the ball. How she cried and cried, and how her crying turned to wailing and turned further into rude remarks and empty threats at the nurses. But her cries did not go unanswered, because in addition to the drastically increasing turnover rate for the workers at that facility, her fairy godmother had come down to offer her aid. This was a divine spirit that watched over Cinderella with a hook for a hand and should have probably intervened in the girl's life much earlier. But she was here now, and with her magic, Cinderella with a hook for a hand was sure to make it to the prince's ball. The fairy godmother pulled out her magic wand, and with the first wave of her wand, she enchanted her straitjacket, turning it into an enchanted straitjacket. A straitjacket that would no longer bind her arms and hands, but still had a thoughtful spell on them to keep her from strangling herself or others. With the second wave of her wand, Cinderella with a hook for a hand was given a marvelous glass hook. With this, she could be the envy of all the girls at the ball as the chandelier light glistened through it and the blood of her dance partner's hand dribbled against it. The final third wave of her wand enchanted the alarm sirens in the asylum that had already been set off, turning them into cheering encouragement to help Cinderella with a hook for a hand run faster through the hallways and jump out the second story window with much more needed resilience. That night, when the prince attended the royal ball, he was greeted by the most stunning and elegant young woman, as charming as she was mysterious. A woman as fair and beautiful as this could only be welcomed in the most royally formal way possible, by showing her to his private carriage and driving her to a remote lookout spot where all the teens made out. Eager to be one of those teens, the prince switched on the radio and stared deeply into his mysterious guest's eyes. Just as they were about to create outs with each other, an emergency broadcast came on the radio. A violent lunatic had escaped from custody and was prowling the surrounding woods. The obsessive and violent nature of this subject made her a dangerous individual and likely to attack unsuspecting carriagists. The broadcast chilled the girl in the prince's company. She knew too well how close the correctional home was to this part of the road. Despite the prince's confidence that their night wouldn't end in them getting their arteries gouged out of their shoulders, she insisted that they drive back to the castle. Frustrated but not wanting this night to turn into another criminal case, the prince started the ignition of their carriage and drove it back to the castle. He walked around the carriage to open his guest's side of the door when something he saw made him freeze in place. There, on the handle of the carriage door, was a severed, bloody glass hook. Only a woman of the most sleek elegance could have a wrist stump as dainty as the owner of this hook, 
and she would have to be of the most deranged nature to attempt to break into the royal carriage, a fine combination that surely made her the ideal partner for the king's own firstborn son. The prince wasted no time in gathering his attendants to collect the hook and search the countryside for his owner. And so the royal attendants set out on their quest, searching from mansion to mansion and home to home for the unknown young woman with a wrist stump fair enough to fit into the enchanted glass hook. Alas, they yielded no results, no matter how thoroughly they searched, for every wrist they encountered was just a hair too big to fit into the glass hook, and also they had hands attached to them. Even the women who chopped off their own hands upon the arrival of the attendants and the promise of royal marriage found it did little to help them, though the local dukes and marquises were equally impressed by the insane tenacity of those girls and quickly courted them, much to their delight. After checking all the castles and all the mansions and all the homes, they finally resolved to search the remote wooded areas of the kingdom like they probably should have done in the first place. There they came across Cinderella with a hook for a hand, lying face down in the muddy road in front of them, cold to the touch and nearly beyond resuscitation. The prince had ordered them to fit the glass hook on every living girl they could find, and with this limp subject just barely making the qualification, they tried the glass hook on her and were amazed to find that running the vagrant over would have been a horrible error. This was the wrist they had been looking for all along, the one that could perfectly fit into the glass hook, and the one that belonged to the girl who would marry their prince. One carriage ride and weeks of physical rehabilitation later, and Cinderella with a hook for a hand was back to her old self. Now at the prince's side, with her hand around his shoulder and her hook dug into his specially made corkboard vest, she glared at every shadow that got near her, and giggled in a way that was either nervous or threatening, and smiled with a smile so bright that her slightly spaced out and unusually pointy teeth seemed as beautiful as a dentist pet wolf. How she laughed and sang and only ever responded to other people with yes or no answers to questions she may or may not have been listening to or was even capable of comprehending. Yes, Cinderella with a hook for a hand thought herself very happy, and the prince thought himself the luckiest prince on God's earth. And the other fair maiden who was in the carriage the night before thought herself so traumatized that she never left her bedroom again and became a horrible burden on her family. And the story thought itself ended, and they were all of them correct. A dream is a wish your heart makes when you're fast asleep.